<laughs> yeah, no, sorry, I forgot to hit the record button. Oh, and a good note about the record button, uh, we will actually be sending out the link to this uh, very presentation via YouTube once we get that uploaded later today. Um, so you'll probably see something in your inbox tomorrow at some point uh, with the YouTube link to this event. So you can feel free to pass it along to colleagues, or if you really have desired to watch it again, you could do that uh, at your leisure later on. But, uh, but yeah, I just thought that would be nice and convenient for everybody to have that. So uh, James, sorry about the uh, mild interruption. They're, they're actually all yours this time. Yeah, of course they're going to watch this over and over again. I mean, why wouldn't they? I mean, it's going to be like their favorite movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of like You Got Mail. It's just going to be a classic. Uh, I don't know about You Got Mail. We're not doing like a romantic thing here, but. <laughs> well, I don't know. They don't need to know what happens on the other end of this line. <laughs> Hopefully we're not going back to electronic mail and um, <laughs> all that stuff anyways. Uh, so thank you all for coming in. Um, um, so our company, so AMI, for those of you who do not know who we are, um, we are an old BIOS company. If you do know who we are, you probably know us from the BIOS. Um, we also um, do remote access controller software um, uh, that we OEM out to um, a bunch of major um, companies. So somewhere, somehow, we are in more than half the computers in the world today um, as a company. Um, that is with uh, a bunch of different products that we have between the BIOS remote access controllers. Um, and one notable thing there in the red, you can see the Avago. Um, of course, they um, just merged with uh, Broadcom. But the LSI. So um, the LSI Mega Raid controller, that was actually developed by American Megatrends um, in, in the 90s, and we sold that off uh, to them. Um, we were expecting, obviously, just it's a company decision. We expected things to go a different way. And um, so anyways, we brought that same team back to AMI, and that's what's developed the Store Trends product line that um, we're talking about today. Uh, we have a lot of patents. Uh, this is our own technology. It's nothing that we're just putting a wrapper around and saying, hey, we have the next best GUI for this same thing. Uh, nothing like that. So this is our own technology and stuff. And we have a lot of installations uh, worldwide. You can see all of our offices and stuff like that. So, um, so thank you all for coming in, and we'll kind of dig into um, Hybrid or all flash, what you know, what to do, what to look at. Uh, here you can see um, just standard legacy environment, uh, five um, shelves, um, getting a usable capacity about 40 terabytes, and you'll be looking at you know at at a normal load, you'll be looking at about 10 millisecond latency, um, you know, and with that, your maximum IOPS, so your IOs per second, will be about 13,750 um, uh, with a mixed workload there. So you can see here the rack space your 15U with each um, individual shelf. You're looking at dual power. You're looking at a lot of spinning drives, a lot of heat created, uh, all that kind of stuff of which you have to cool that, you have to power that. So obviously there is overhead with that. Um, and you're looking at a CapEx at about $3 a gig in general. Um, and, you know, store trends, even with us, I know we show, um, you know, an EMC rack here, but even store trend spinning disk solutions have the same um, just overhead. You, the physicality of what disks can actually provide and what they do, and also the heat that comes out of them, the power that draws from them, everybody's at that limitation. So obviously that's why everybody's talking about all flash. You know, you can get a lot more into um, basically the smaller system um, with the latest technologies of deduplication and compression. Uh, here we look at a three and a half to one ratio, 12 terabytes raw capacity on the right side here. Um, you know, so you get a usable capacity of about the same. Um, the latency, obviously, that's a lot faster. These are SSDs, even though there is the overhead with dedupe and compression, stuff like that. But your maximum IOPS, these go up tremendously, almost eight times. Um, you know, and obviously the rack space, everything else comes down with that when you're looking at a lot less power drives, everything overall. Um, and even better, um, because of the way that we're using um, enterprise MLC drives and uh, consumer-grade MLC, MLC drives, and man managing those technologies, um, basically we're able to get a very low CapEx um, of $1.24 a gig, basically. Um, but now that is given that raw capacity in that dedupe ratio right there. So uh, that's kind of one of the things that we'll talk about today. So the other note is, well, okay, what about server-side cache? What value does that bring us? Um, and obviously it's a different technology, so it's, uh, it's a weird argument, and some might say, 
Um, just because, there, I mean, there are values with that. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there's no space for that or whatnot. No, there's absolutely value in server-side cache. Um, in general, you kind of target 10% space of SSD versus your total amount of space. Uh, so we're looking at 40 terabytes. So here we'll look at four terabytes worth of server-side cache. Um, you know, the power, the CO2 emissions, I mean, it, it's, it's not going to be a lot, so we're not going to even worry about the overhead there. Uh, there is an additional UI with management. Um, and, you know, the latency is really the, the big focus here. So you're looking at, you know, 400 microseconds for um, reads. You know, you're looking at 10 milliseconds or so for writes in some situations just because you're having to mirror that data across, you know, whatever wire. It's, uh, I'm more than assuming it's going to be LAN. Um, and when you do that, though, there is overhead, and that's not really what they're really designed to do. I think the reads is really where it's, where it's supposed to fit. Um, so if you start mixing these averages, you can kind of see here at this 5 milliseconds, 3 milliseconds, and we can definitely be a lot less than that just by having everything integrated into one solution. And that's where the shared storage really fits in. But also the value, the dollar, you know, 24 gig here uh, versus, you know, $6 gig value on the other side. So, you know, there's just um, a huge note there uh, of how you kind of compare them and, and what to look at. Um, but there is value there. You can see the read um, uh, 400 microseconds. It's very, very fast, um, assuming it is populated in there. But we'll, we'll go ahead and assume that just for the, the better uh, benefit of it. Okay. So now if we look at a hybrid. So the StoreTrends 3500i is the hybrid solution. Um, and you can see here, you know, um, usable capacity, uh, the way it worked out, you know, 45 terabytes. Um, your latency, the guarantee latencies, sub three milliseconds, and that's just kind of just in case there was, you know, misses that come from our unit and stuff from the from the SSDs, of which that's kind of the X factor there, right? Um, the rack space, though, you're still in 3U. You're still looking at a lot less power emissions and stuff like that. Um, and in general, dollar per gig, you're, you know, that's, it's very good, very good value. Um, although they're about similar in price, they really do have their specific functionalities and where they really fit in. Um, so now if we compare the two, the problem is the customers that don't have that dedupe ratio. Um, and we'll talk about and we'll dig into, you know, dedupe and what the factors are that are there. But say you don't get that 3.5 to 1, say you just get the standard 1.8 to 1, which is really, it really is the dumbfounded um, standard, by the way, uh, just in case you're wondering at a, a true worst case scenario. Um, the usable capacity, now that drops down to 23 terabytes. Of course, you're looking at the same performance and power metrics and stuff like that. Now you're getting over $2 a gig as opposed to $1 a gig. Now there is still value in it, it's still cheaper than that legacy system. However, you know, with, um, with the value of it, it starts getting away from, from where we're at. Hey, James, had a great question come in. Um, I think you might address this a little bit later, but wanted to go ahead and get it on your radar. Um, great question came in, said, uh, how do you manage um, the issues introduced with all SSDs and all those rights? Going to knock that out of the park in about 10 minutes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I knew you would just want to go ahead and get it on your radar so that you can put a little extra oomph behind it. Yeah. You know Speaking of, uh, <laughs> so going into um, SSDs, why doesn't everybody have SSDs anyways? Um, obviously, the price is uh, out of control. If you look at the dollar per gig of SSDs, uh, in particular enterprise uh, MLC drives, um, and, uh, or SLC drives even, uh, even worse. And so what you're looking at is a very, very high dollar per gig. Um, and then if you did want to go to the cheaper consumer-grade MLC drives, well, I mean, it, dollar per gig's right there. However, they're limited on endurance. So now you kind of can't get the best of both worlds there. Um, and that obviously goes into our second point of they are limited on endurance. So we do utilize enterprise MLC drives um, specifically for the hybrid array. Um, and then for the all flash array, they are basically our right tier as kind of what he was talking about there. Um, so we're making sure that we have plenty of write space for that. So, you know, for each drive, we're looking at 87 petabytes worth of writes over the lifespan of it. Uh, at a minimum, you're looking at four drives. So that's a lot of writes. If you divide that up by five years, um, on average, you're about 10 to 15 times of drive writes per day for a five-year span. Um, 
literally that that is uh, one heck of an IO load if you guys divide that up and stuff like that. Um, so that's where endurance comes in, and obviously that's a huge factor. Um, but then there's also the well for the all flash rate. You know, what am I going to get for dedupe? I have no idea. You know, stuff like that. So we can actually watch these things, and uh, we actually have tools that can kind of try to help you out uh, if you didn't want to do a POC or you're just on the fence about it. Um, and then, of course, there's a question of DDO performance and what to do there. Um, so we'll talk about all these things. Um, and first of all, so normally we talk about IOPS and what kind of IOPS you're going to get out of the system. Um, and so IOPS, now you can see here, um, with the different solutions, so you have 500 drives of 7K RPMs, uh, 400 drives of 10K, uh, 285 drives about a 15K, and you know you have four disks of SSDs can easily get to the 100,000 IOPS numbers. Um, if you want to start exceeding that, um, in all the situations, you could actually exceed that. However, your latency is going to start really driving up uh, in that regard. So. Uh, latency is the main factor there. So now, how does latency correlate uh, in all these solutions? So, um, so with the 500 drives, 7K RPM, even though you have 500 of these things spinning, giving you that 100,000 IOPS number, you're still looking at about, you know, probably 12 to 15 milliseconds worth of latency at that load. Now, of course, you know, if your peak I/O load is 100,000. Um, in the middle of the day, if you're not at that load, well, basically that reduces down, obviously. The time it takes to respond to each individual I.O. reduces because it's not under full load. It's not having to do that 100,000. So, um, and obviously this scales down, so 12 milliseconds, 7.5 milliseconds for 15K. Now, SSD, though, we're at 1 millisecond, so it's a huge difference there in that regard. Now, the other issue is, so say I had 100,000, or say I had 50,000 IOPS, and I was running 500 um, 7K RPM drives, well, is my latency going to be 7.5 milliseconds? No, not really. It might be close to there just because um, it, you're really at a, a low I.O. load, but most likely it's still going to be at 10 milliseconds in, in there. And that's just because it still takes so much time for these drives to basically seek out whatever um, spot on the disk they need to go to and stuff like that. Um, even for store trend spinning disk solutions, we actually do things to optimize that, which if you guys are wanting to hear about that, just contact me or Tyler and we can talk about that stuff on a different day because obviously we could go, I could go down to a rabbit hole um, talking about that stuff. So, so here's how latency kind of fits in with those IOPS. Um, so kind of going forward, um, so the latency, so we talk about these milliseconds and it's like, who cares? Um, so 800 milliseconds, um, hopefully you don't know what that is, but really if you start seeing an average um, latency of that or greater in a VMware environment, uh, actually the VMFS will freeze up and they'll actually lock VMs and stuff like that. Uh, and they're assuming that there's some sort of hardware issue or something like that. So obviously you don't want to be there, um, basically you have to rescan the HBA, you have to reset everything. Um, the worst case scenarios, you know, you're looking at 50 to 100 milliseconds worth of latency. Um, it's absolutely bad. Yeah, <laughs> the the one word to describe each of these is is really where it fits in. You just don't want to be there. Everything just absolutely takes forever to run. Um, you're probably, or I I would say hopefully, you're just hitting that in the middle of the day. Some random person or people are running a very particular report in SQL or something like that. Um, or there would be something like a boot storm at the beginning of the day for some VDI environments that, um, you know, they talk about, oh, well, you can do this VDI environment on spinning drives, this and that. And what they don't tell you is if you shut these down at the end of the night to try to save power and all that kind of stuff, well, when you do spin them back up, you're going, it's going to take time, and that's where latency does come in. Um, and then, of course, you know, a slow latency, this is where a lot of people are at, um, but most everybody's is 5 to 20 milliseconds. Um, in particular, if you're on a self-made type SSD solution or if you're just simply doing one of these spinning drive solutions that, you know, if you have 2,000 IOPS and you have 16 drives of 7K RPM drives, um, you know, you're going to be in this range of that 15, 10 milliseconds. Well, you're going to be right in here and everything's going to be all right. You know, things respond eventually. Everything's okay. Um, now, I had a customer, and this is the good fast is what this is supposed to be, but his requirement last year 
was, hey, I want this thing to be snappy. I don't want to mess around with this and that. Um, so he was asking me, what do I need to do to get it to snap? Um, he was looking at, you know, he was actually in the higher 20 to 50 millisecond range, and he had two shelves already. He was like, okay, what if I add another shelf? What's my latency going to look like? And he wasn't happy with the answer of, well, it's going to be really a sixth of the latency um, of a reduction just because it's not, it's not to scale of adding another shelf. So now you have three shelves, so it should say, you know, a third of the time, something like that, of savings. Um, so anyhow, uh, we put in a, it's an all-flash hybrid, basically it's an all-flash head with an expansion shelf for capacity, and it is snappy now. <laughs> he does not have that problem anymore. Um, so, anyway, so that's what we're here to talk about, um, and you can be the smiling face with the sunglasses on. Um, so how can it fit in? So we talk about these SSDs, um, and the capacity of the SSD is horrible. So what do you require? DDP compression. Um, this technology is obviously becoming mainstream everywhere, um, and that being the case, you know, reliability increases, um, knowledge increases of different workloads and stuff like that on the engineering side. But, you know, once people see it's more reliable, more adopted, now it's just absolutely, it, it's turning into a, a requirement, if not a checklist requirement, um, for end users um, like you all. Um, so, um, Permabit did these numbers, so I liked the chart. Um, and just kind of to give you an idea of what they really expect, and you can see this chart was released 2013, 2014. Um, so the rest of this expectation is, I mean, it's just following actual numbers that they've had um, for years. Um, and you can see 75% of data is basically duplicate data. Um, now, you're not going to get this 44 zettabytes to 10 zettabytes by everybody inducing deduplication just because you're still going to have backups that are on a different system, and you're obviously not going to be able to dedupe across systems and sites and stuff like that. Um, however, it kind of gives you perspective of how much data is really out there uh, and how much is duplicate data. Now, a lot of this duplicate data, though, is, you know, within infrastructures um, alone to where you absolutely could have this on a shared storage appliance and not have to worry about saving multiple copies of it. Um, so, in DDP and compression, I'm really going to, this is a dumbed down picture. So don't take offense, this is really just for the people that may not understand anything about what deduplication <laughs> um, is. Uh, so with this fancy picture we have here, so we have these red files, we have some blue Excel files here, we got a little, I think that's like a PowerPoint, uh, pinkish fuchsia file, something like that. Um, so what we'll do is we have all these duplicates, so we have two red files, two of everything here, you can see that. Um, so what we do is we store one file, that is deduplication. And in this example right here, this is a two to one deduplication rate. Very simple, nothing crazy um, conceptually here. Uh, when it starts getting a little crazier is the fact that compression's on top of this. Now, um, the other, uh, or the better part of this example is basically the fact that these are all files. Um, they're compressed, 99% of everybody's, everybody's files are Office type files, PowerPoint X, DocX, XLSX, all that stuff. So they're compressed by win uh, Windows, by Microsoft. Um, so in that, you're only going to get a 1.8 to X, uh, 8 to 1 ratio out of these um, files just in their natural um, situation. So this is actually a little more than 2 to 1 just because these files are literally reduced down a little bit further due to the compression algorithm in there. Um, now, one thing um, that, that we do that helps out with compression and dedupe on the performance side, so we talk about the performance increase here that we try to do with our technology, and that's basically the fact that we do deduplication first. So if we do come in and say we're rewriting this red file here, well, there's a lot of overhead in compression, so we want to avoid doing that at all costs. So we actually keep our hash table on the deduplicated, um, on the deduplication side, before compression. So now we know, hey, this is a duplicate file. We do have to check that file, though, because hash is um, actually not 100% reliable. So we check that file to make sure that it's accurate. And if it is, then, hey, we just don't even write that to SSDs. We'll actually just store that in RAM and say, hey, there's a metadata update and done. Um, the endurance increase, now, once again, you're taking that same file and you're not even writing it down to disk. 
you're saving that, that space right there. So say on a two to one ratio, you're only writing to the disks half the time. So there's a huge advantage um, in that regard as well. Um, there are a lot of com uh, competitors that'll go ahead and write the data down to disk and then check back later. Well, of course, eventually you, you may run out of space if you don't have that downtime to check back later. Um, you're also going to waste SSD endurance by doing that because now you're writing the data. Later on, you're going to re read the data back and then dedupe it or check to see if it's dedupable and stuff like that, then rewrite the data down to disk. So um, very inefficient in that regard. Um, three to one ratio is pretty much an average kind of number that we'll use, um, and it's just easier that way uh, if we don't know ahead of time what we're looking at. Um, and of course, all of this is a huge cost savings by being able to utilize this um, technology. And next slide. Okay, so here I have these examples. Um, backups, VMs, VDI, the desktop, database environments, with workflows, a huge note there, exchange and user directories. Up front, let's just say these are, you know, 10 terabytes each um, of um, actual space. So now when we go into just compression, what do we look at uh, for these space savings? You can see backups 1.2 to 1, uh, VMs 1.7 to 1. Uh, database environments, so you're looking at like a three to one there, um, but that's really the best that you get out of there, user directories and exchange. You know, you're looking at a 1.3 to one or so. Um, so not a huge advantage if, you know, whoever it is does just support compression. Um, now if you just do deduplication, where would that 10 terabytes go down to? And you can see here 30 to one for backups. Um, in general, you're not going to be using this for a backup solution, however, that availability is kind of there, and because it's so efficient, you can actually do a lot with that. Um, but it's not a normal situation. I'm not going to lie to anybody or anything like that. It's just the best case. Um, and then you have VDI, um, VMs, and stuff like that. You can get that down to like a 25 to 1. Um, databases, 12 to 1. Exchange, 6 to 1. And then user directory, it's 1.5 to 1. And then, of course, you know, the 35 to 1. And this is with both of them put together, the green is. Um, and there's huge notes about this. So this is a perfect world example, though. And this is what everybody does, and it's, it's you know, it is what it is. There's, there's nothing I can say about what everybody does. And obviously, we're not going to say, well, in the same situation, that it's not going to be the exact same for us. Ddupe does what it can do. Nobody's reinventing Ddupe. They're just deduping in different ways, um, or basically storing hash in different ways. Compression, nobody's doing compression any differently. They're just storing it in different ways and stuff like that. Um, so one huge note um, that I have uh, actual examples that I can talk about. Um, so the database environment with workflow. So of course you have these parentheses here. What is workflow? So workflow is basically a bunch of different copies of this database. Um, and we have some customers this works perfect for them. Um, but there's other customers this doesn't work perfectly for them. Um, and that's why we still are pushing and selling hybrids and we're, we're going with that technology. Um, just because not everybody's going to get that. If you don't have multiple copies of the database, then you're going to be looking at a two to one. So, uh, you know, SQL and, and Windows and all that, they are compressing that data. They're trying to be as efficient as possible on their side, uh, of which is good. However, it does reduce our effective uh, ratios. Um, it is hard to dedupe compressed data. So with workflow, basically if you have an application that ends up creating passive copies that are read-only, kind of like a, a call center or something like that, and it spins off individual copies of that database just for the callers to be able to read from or whatnot, and then they roll that data in uh, at the end of the day. Or if there's something where you have a reporting database, an active database, and, and a bunch of those kinds of situations, that would be what they consider workflow. Um, in exchange, this is a perfect example. So we show a nine to one here. Well, there's a story. Um, so we have um, this customer. They had a 10 terabyte database just to keep the numbers easy. And so what they did was, um, it, it, but it was their about 10 terabytes, so it's not a small database. Um, but they had their small exchange or their 10 terabyte exchange, um, and they had it compressed. So it was 10 down to about six or something like that. Hey, they saved a lot. You know, that's, that's a good 66% savings there um, with that. So then we put the exchange on our unit, and it went down to three terabytes. Well, six to three, now you're looking at a two to one ratio. Well, that looks like a user directory situation, not an exchange environment situation, right? 
well, okay, what happened? So we found that they were doing the default, it's checkmarked by default, um, dedupe, uh, or not dedupe, compression within Exchange. Had them un uncompress it, expand it out, then put it on our unit, that went down to a terabyte worth of usable space. So that did get the nine to one ratio that we were talking about and we touted about and all this and that. Um, so there are things like this that kind of play into this and it messes everybody up. Um, eventually, somebody's gonna have to decide on one or the other of do we really just, you know, let applications do this or do we let storage vendors do what they do and, and continue on there, so. Uh, we'll see down the road. And then, of course, user directories. This is the same idea of Exchange doing its compression. Um, basically, Microsoft Office doing its um, compression. You're really looking at about a two-to-one ratio, and that's, I want to say, 99% of the time in that, in that situation. So if you do have a lot of user data and stuff like that that you plan on storing, um, you know, this is where the argument comes in for having a hybrid solution versus an all-flash solution. If it's a, you know, if you're only worried about your exchange environment and you're like, fine, I'll decompress it and that's all we're doing or something like that, like the database environment to where, yeah, we have a lot of copies of this data and, and we do all these reporting, hey, this is going to be a great solution for you. So this is why we anyways um, have both solutions and, and we kind of go that route. Um, okay, so how does this apply? Um, so VDI obviously had this infrastructure, you know, all this kind of stuff here. Um, so what happens um, on a hybrid solution? So the pitfall of the hybrid is, you know, we do have volume pinning and stuff like that just because, you know, we don't want to waste SSD space on things that don't require it. And we are watching the blocks as they're accessed to see where they kind of should fit. Um, and the main thing that needs performance is really the replicas in the Temp OS space. So the replicas, this is literally a replica, a copy of the golden image, and this is where all the desktops spin off of to basically um, to boot and to run and all that stuff. When they individually update their OSs, that's the temp OS space, um, they do think that they're individual desktops, they have to do their system logging and all that stuff. Absolutely expected. Um, well, all of that needs to have the lowest latency possible and to kind of go from there. Um, user space, so now we have this tier zero, which we're saying SSD space there. Uh, we do support caching and tiering in our hybrid. Um, so it kind of gives us that instantaneous performance if there was um, data that was accessed from spinning drives. Um, but we also have that SSD tier to monitor and say, hey, these are actual hot uh, blocks. We're going to maintain these to be an SSD no matter what. Um, with the user space, you know, you don't want to use um, that two to one ratio like I was talking about on SSDs or in this case, you know, it's just allocating the space. Tier one would be like 15K SAS drives. You want it to be fast for the users, and it depends on how many users and stuff like that, or if you even have persistent disks or not. Um, completely environmental, um, situational. Um, and then tier two would be spinning drives. So these golden images, all you literally do is update them, um, stuff like that, and then spin off new replicas, but they're not really accessed heavily to the level of SSD um, IO. So them, snapshots, keeping the old data and stuff like that, you can kind of see where that goes. Uh, we also have the option of, say the temp OS was just cached and not actually um, stored in the SSD tier, we could actually store it down here and just let the um, SSD caches uh, kind of manage that data. So we have a bunch of different ways of doing these things. Um, so now obviously with an all flash array, you don't have to have a duplicate um, anything of temp OS space or any of that. But everything gets SSD performance. Um, obviously, we're going to be using a lot less space, uh, in particular with the replicas. They are literally duplicates of the gold images. That is literally going to have, or three times or four times, the overall data plus each individual desktop. You know, you're going to get one and a half to two to one just with the individual um, actual golden image, the actual image there. So, uh, so a lot of advantages with um, the all flash in that regard. Um, and VDI is a perfect scenario for, for this, assuming that you're not going to have a lot of user space um, and or you don't have a lot of users to where it's not going to take up more than, you know, a few terabytes or whatnot to where you can actually scope this stuff out um, and have the SSD space for it. Uh, when we talk about databases, 
Uh, and so one thing we'll show later on, uh, so we talk about SSD tier layer and spinning disk layer, and literally you do not need your whole database in SSDs, and I know everybody thinks that they do, um, but, you know, we have customers that they now see, yeah, you, you literally don't. Um, but anyways, I'll show that and actually prove that here in a second. But it doesn't matter what type of database you have, um, you can kind of pin these into different situations, you know, uh, with the hybrid array, and now, of course, if you're going into an all-flash, hey, everything gets that steep performance. Uh, and the only huge um, note there is the snapshot space down at the bottom that was getting Tier 2 spinning drive space. Well, one of the complaints was, hey, you know, when I mount my snapshot, I, went, I wanted to test this database at this time, or I was giving a test database to one of these developers, and they're just saying it's slow, it's just not giving the same performance and say it messes up timing or this or that or something like that, well, now with an all-flash rate, you can get the same performance out of that. So that is really the only difference there. Um, the other side note is the capacity. So if you're getting a 15 to 1 ratio, you have that workflow of multiple copies of the databases and stuff like that, then this is a good situation to where otherwise you really do need to be looking at a hybrid just for the capacity and um, basically what I'll show you with hot data here in a second. Um, and then the other note is, um, what, what do we do for backups and disaster recovery and stuff? So before SSDs, and this has been just a flood over the last two years of, um, of customers, just the absolute requirements uh, for performance out there. Um, wide area data services, so we're actually um, optimizing the link. It's similar to like a riverbed or silver, beep, uh, silver peak technology, um, so, but it's our own method of doing this. It's our own blocks, and it's sending our snapshots across the wire. So we are looking at only changes, and then we're compressing, deduping, and encrypting if required, depends on your business, um, that data. So we're reducing the data and sending it absolutely as fast as possible. Now, another note with that WAN optimization, if you're talking to anybody else, this is not just increasing the TCP window or any of that kind of stuff. We're doing this a lot better, a lot faster than everybody else. Hey, James, I just wanted to hop right back in real quick. Sorry. Not allowed. I was dealing with some very uh, urgent pizza-related uh, emergencies. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it, it does happen from time to time. Sorry, guys, uh, uh, for everyone who hasn't gotten their pizza yet, we've reached out to Domino's to figure out what this issue actually is. Um, usually they're pretty good, but occasionally with logistics of this scale, um, you know, numbers can get punched in wrong at some point down the line. So um, we are we're figuring it out, and we'll get back to you immediately. Um, in the meantime, though, we did have some great questions come across the line. Um, that, uh, that I thought we might dive into real quick. Um, one is kind of a, a very simple question, but it's, you know, it's um, very important to a lot of people's environment. And uh, does, this store, does this product do storage tiering? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I talk about volume pinning here um, basically to say, you know, you can guarantee this performance for these blocks and this and that. Now, um, we absolutely do uh, storage tiering. So what we'll do is, so say for the SQL volume up here, um, really, we'll say, hey, you know, pin this thing up there, and we can set the um, the demotion policy. So basically, the policy for maintaining those blocks in that tier uh, for X amount of time, a year or even a week. So if we do set it for a week, though, this is where a lot of our tiering policies start kicking in. So what we'll do is, if a block hasn't been accessed within a week, you can also set it to a month or something like that if you want to, if you're worried about reports or whatnot. Um, but if you do set it to, say, a week, which is the default policy anyways, those blocks that are absolutely untouched, unread, unwritten to, anything, whatever you want to look at, um, those will then demote automatically down to the lower tiers. And they'll just kind of step down as they age. Um, and so, of course, we support up to, um, you can check it by years. It, it doesn't matter for us. Um, there's there's um, no real limitation there. I think it's like 20 years or something like that might be the limitation. but. Um, so anyways, we absolutely do that, and we're watching each individual block within these tiers, and uh, by default, we are tiering them down automatically. Very cool. Well, now, not to, not to put you on the spot too much or anything like that, but we had some um, questions relating to us versus other vendors, and one of them that came across was, uh, do we do caching um, similar to the way Nimble does it? Okay, so caching with Nimble is a little different. Um, so they use NVRAM. Um, the problems with NVRAM, well, uh, I'll tell you, the, let's talk about the pro, though. The pro is it's a little bit faster than using SSDs for caching. Um, not a lot faster, though. We're talking 200 to 400 microseconds. 
um, in that regard. Now, what they're doing there, though, they're only holding their write cache in that portion. So if you get a huge Nimble array, you're going to get 64 gigs worth of MVRAM caching. That's our minimum on our baseline for write caching within our array. And then even so, with that 64 gigs, the rest of that space, um, there's another 350 gigs open that we have in array zero for all read cache. So now that's completely managed within two drives of our array. Then we separately have our tier, which is managing the hot actual access blocks, which is kind of a staging area for them for their compression algorithm. Um, so over the long haul, basically we absolutely do not overwrite or over-provision AR arrays, which is one thing I've heard about them, but also the actual SSD space that we have because we'll, we'll know what the hot data is, and we're doing this just in a very, very efficient manner. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. If it doesn't, I can go into more detail at any time. Just reach out. Cool deal. And uh, just had one more quick one. Um, help, uh, heck, I don't know if this might not be quick or not, but um, so to really put you on the spot here, um, we had a question come across, and, you know, legally say what you can, but what makes, uh, what makes this better than pure storage arrays? Um, everything. So, <laughs> no. Um, so the difference with pure storage, um, so basically they're using all consumer-grade SSDs. Um, I really highly question what their, um, their value they say basically for the endurance of these SSDs. And we'll see in a couple of years when they actually get enough installation time under their belt. Um, in that regard, um, but you're very limited. So you're, with consumer-grade SSDs, you're looking at a fifth of writes um, per day over the lifespan of five years of per SSD. Um, they are doing some things to where they're actually, you know, duplicating data in different places and stuff like that. Uh, so you can kind of, it's not even a RAID DP like NetApp does. It's uh, a RAID DP, sorry, would be like two copies of the data effectively. Uh, but, you know, they're doing multiples and multiples and stuff like that. But the big deal there is really the consumer-grade SSDs and then also the functionality of um, basically the replication. They just add, um, added in um, replication and stuff. They're not going to have, you know, the overall, the depth that, um, you know, other vendors that have been around for a while are going to have in that regard. Um, and they are a heck of a lot uh, more expensive than us uh, by a long shot. So um, when we talk about... Um, Going back to these backups, so one thing we were talking about, I'm sorry, I did get off track here. Um, with the hybrid array, so pinning volumes, you can guarantee performance for these individual tiers. And say Microsoft Dynamics, it's a larger block size, so basically you can, you can kind of efficiently run it more on a tier one, tier two type situation, so I kind of put that in the middle there. Um, but, you know, the DR space, so when you replicate, and say it's an active-active environment between the two sites, well, that DR space, in general, if you're not managing this, we have to pin that down on a low tier. Otherwise, it's going to be taking up SSD space for all the changes on the other site. Um, so we definitely don't want that. Now, however, with an all-flash array, the benefit here, basically, if you did fail over to this other site because there was a catastrophe, you do have all-flash performance for the DR space. So that DR space is going to be the... You know, say you had exchange at the other site and you had another, you know, whatever of SQLs, you know, all that would be in that DR space. Well, you do want that to have SSD performance. And as we did failover in the hybrid, you'd be able to promote it up, and it would take a little bit of time to get up. But it, it, you, in a day, you're, you're going to be fully up. Your hot data is going to be in the SSDs, period. Um, however, you're instantaneously going to have SSD um, flash space for this. So... So very good in that regard. Um, so now, how do we know that what I'm saying is just not a bunch of garbage and this and that? Um, and we did a few things to try to help the case and just try to help everybody out, quite honestly. Uh, so we have the Store Trends I data tool. Uh, we have two pieces of it. They're separate installers, but we just kind of wanted to keep them under the iData name and stuff. Um, so anyway, so what you can do is you can go to Store Trends Resources, iData, um, or the DDoP Analyzer tool, which is the other piece of this. Um, and you can kind of get um, an idea of where you're at. So DDoP, this is one of the newer things right here. And you're going to see it's um, I would, rough, the rough term, I guess, for it. But, um, you know, uh, it's really going to give you your DDoP ratio on a, you know, on a file level or on a folder level for what you're really going to expect from a particular data load. 
Uh, it is only installable right now on Windows and stuff. I mean, it is it is a new tool as we just you know we just released 3600 a few months ago and stuff. Um, and then with the iData tool, that'll actually give you your performance metrics. Um, so it is a separate installer. Um, with the iData tool, there is no uh, real overhead. Um, you would install this on just a utility server in your network and then basically put in the IPs, which you can see on the left-hand pane here. You can either do a discovery and select everything, uh, or you can just pick particular IPs. You can actually put the values in here and just select either VMware, vCenter, or Windows. Uh, if you put in vCenter, it'll just load in all your hosts automatically for you. Uh, but put in username, password, so then it'll be able to pull the results. Uh, for Windows, it'll pull it every five minutes, just pulling the WMI counters. Um, with vCenter, it'll just pull the performance counters out, just so we have that stuff. At the end of that, you'll get an overview report, of which will also divide out into individual server reports and stuff like that, so you can kind of see all that stuff. Um, so, very simple to use, though. And again, you know, Exchange, SQL, um, you know, vSphere, what have you. But then one thing that came after the fact is if you are scoping like a, a VDI deployment and you don't really know what each individual department's I.O. load is on a user-by-user -user basis, um, we actually came up with um, being able to use it for, you know, you pick whoever in accounting, pick whoever in development, uh, sales, whatnot. Uh, and then so then you can get an idea of, you know, what kind of desktop usage are they going to have when you do go to VDI. So a uh, very nice tool, very clean to use. Um, and uh, yeah, it's absolutely free. There's zero obligation, zero anything in, in doing that. Um, so now if we go a step further, uh, so what does that tell us? So we're looking at data and how much data is actually accessed. Uh, the initial reason I actually did all these um, tests, I looked into a bunch of customers' debug dumps uh, to see what their tiering values look like and then compared it to the iData that they had. And luckily everything turned out um, similar, which is a uh, first good thing. Uh, second good thing, we found actually how much data is really accessed. You can see this cold data. This is not accessed at all within a week. So this is absolutely just a waste of space. Um, with that being said, if you have 40 terabytes and you're looking at, you know, 40% of it um, is actually accessed, well, the rest of that is just free space right there. And that's a lot of space to keep on all flash if you did want to go all flash. But also, I mean, that's a lot of space to keep in flash if you had a hybrid solution. And that's where hybrid solutions come in to where you just throw that on spinning drives and it just is what it is. If it does get access, it's fully available through cache. And then if we see that it's continually accessed, we just promote it as a tier. So you can kind of go those different routes there. Um, but here you can see the yellow is really our focus. And even 100 plus accesses, this is within an hour. It was accessed 100 times or more. If you divide that up into 60 minutes and 60 seconds, that's not even an IOP on average. So this still isn't a huge amount of data. You can very easily uh, manage that with um, just spinning drives. Now, there is a smaller percentage here, which would be actually SSDs, but it showed just such a small sliver, I just couldn't even mess with it. But, I mean, we're looking at 2 to 3% here in general. Now, this is for infrastructure I.O., so that would be, you know, somebody, they just have their exchange, they have their random database, they have this and that um, and stuff. So then, you know, now if we focus on databases, they're a lot more lean. You can see 70% uh, of the database is absolutely untouched in all my customer examples. And then even so, the 100 plus accesses, it's on a very, very narrow sliver of percentage of the overall infrastructure. Now, some of these are 100 terabytes, some of these are 20 terabytes. Um, customer to customer, but you can still see the percentages still kind of work out. Uh, and of course, they're all different situations and stuff like that. So, um, so now if we mesh these two together, and just to kind of show, you know, well, what are you looking at in these different situations? You know, say you have this um, number right here, and I don't remember what the percentage is with this. Uh, this is like 8%. Um, so three terabytes worth of space if it's a 40 terabyte environment. I mean, that's still a substantial amount of SSD space. Um, to cover that, but 8% is kind of light. In general, we like to scope 10% just to have enough to kind of rotate around and stuff like that. Um, and say you're paranoid, you're like, look, I don't know what's going to get hit when. So then you're look, talking about 12 terabytes of a 40 terabyte environment. Well, now that again is a lot of money basically if you're looking at that much flash space. You know, 4 terabyte SSDs are not cheap. You know, we're looking at 4,500 a piece if you wanted. You need four of them really for 12 terabytes usable there. Um, you know, in general, there's a bunch of different ways to come up with that, but 
the easy math permitting because otherwise if we did smaller drives we're looking at an all flash head type solution or something. So, um, so this is where all flash comes in and there is an advantage there um, just depending on where you're at on the spectrum of which iData helps us out tremendously. Very cool. Uh, James just had a quick one uh, come across here, uh, more in regards to VMware and uh, VMware's provisioning. Um, question that came across was how does your provisioning work with uh, VMware's version of provisioning? Yeah, so uh, we've been a, a VMware TAP Alliance partner since 3.5, um, ESX 3.5. Um, and so basically uh, it, everything works perfectly fine. Um, in general, you don't want to do a thin on top of a thin provision um, type situation just due to over provisioning situations. Uh, if you're talking about VAI primitives, which would be kind of the atomic set and, and, and all that kind of stuff, we support every one of the VAI primitives and all that kind of stuff. So uh, there's no question about VMware support with us. Um, and that's, I mean, we have plenty of installations with Citrix. We've been a partner with Citrix forever. Uh, as well as Microsoft and stuff like that. So uh, compatibility-wise, no problem there. Very cool. Had uh, had one more quick one to sneak in there. This is, a, I think, a very specific um, targeted question, but if we were to do a large scale, a fairly large scale deployment of 80 terabytes usable um, and looking at 90,000 IOPS, which one of our models would sort of fit in that uh, that spectrum of performance capacity required. Yeah, and this is exactly um, the type of solution that ends up being a hybrid type solution just because you're looking at so much capacity. Now, say you're looking at a three to one ratio, which we don't exactly know, you're looking at 25 terabytes worth of usable SSP space, well that's going to be pretty expensive, pretty hard to get to, um, it, it, within reason anyways. Um, so where that is where a hybrid does come in. Um, and depending on um, percentages, you know, we're looking at eight terabytes if we're looking at 10, um, um, 10 percent, um, of which that would easily hit the 90,000. The 90,000 IOPS is no big deal at all. It's just how much space do you require for the 90,000 IOPS. And if it's standard, then basically we're looking at 10 percent, so eight terabytes worth of um, flash and then basically the 80 terabyte solution. We would probably target a hybrid for that um, in that regard. So. Um, so yeah, and this is um, primarily a, a iSCSI solution. We support 10G fiber, 10G copper, um, and then also up to eight one gig NICs per controller, so 16 one gig NICs there. Um, so now, how do we do this? I'm kind of falling way behind. I don't know if I'm going slow or what the deal is, but um, so we're basically managing the write tier and read tier. Write tier is enterprise MLC drives. Read tier is consumer grade M MLC drives um, to make sure that Performance is up as much as possible. So the read, the MLC drives, the standard ones, they are slower than the enterprises. However, in a normal situation, we have almost double those drives versus the enterprise, A, to keep the cost down, B, to get the capacity up, but also the performance will then match because it's about 75% of the performance from the read tier to the write tier drives individually. So now we actually get faster in the read tier. And even better, the read tier, you can basically read from uh, SSDs as many times as you want for basically up to 2,000 years is what spec is. Um, now, if you write to them, that's where your endurance starts wearing out. So that's why we actually manage these blocks. And we're saying of an all-flash array in particular, hey, if your 70%, 60% of your data is untouched at all, we'll throw that in the read tier and not even worry about it write-wise. Now, what happens if it does get written to, though, we have an in-lift cache algorithm inside of here. So say that Z block randomly gets written to, updated, what have you, one time or 400 times, we'll see. So if it's one time, we'll actually cache that in the right tier, and then if we just see it's one time, we'll then flush it down to the read tier. If we see it's continually getting access, we'll then promote it up to um, the other tier. So uh, we support all all the support requirements, um, remote email alert monitoring is probably the most important thing. And we also replace drives as we see the endurance getting low or the medium error is getting high at spinning drives, so all that stuff's available. Um, here you can see kind of all the individual models that we have, um, you know, from the 3400s just spinning drives all the way up to the 3600, which is all enterprise, or all SSD, sorry. Um, and then the hybrid, of course, is the mix therein. Um, so, kind of going into the 3600, 3610. The 3600 is just a lower cost solution. You can't expand with it, but it handles up to 64 terabytes worth of capacity. So we did want to get something to where just about anybody could get in there 
uh, if they wanted to. Uh, we do have a lot of performance testing against us. Uh, storage Review, Tenasia Group checked us out. Uh, SSG Now actually went through the iData tool to make sure all we did was just take the performance monitoring stuff, so we did a little due diligence there. Um, and then, you know, with things like Storage Review, um, they actually just released um, these charts uh, last week. Um, but again, we're still at the top, 6,200 um, transactions per second with 30,000 users. Uh, nobody else has um, come to 6,200 anything. Um, and then even better, at that 6,200 I.O. number, transaction number, we're at 41 milliseconds of average latency to where you can see where these other guys are. You have Dot .hill right here, XIO, HP, Dell, EQ, um, and then here's TGAL down here with five, uh, basically 5,000 milliseconds, five seconds basically worth of average latency. So that's absolutely horrible uh, when you look at the comparisons of what's out there versus what we're doing technology-wise. Um, and all these are very similar solutions in, in all of those cases. Um, and we're even 75%, uh, well, I guess 25% less than everybody else on here with their comparable um, arrays and stuff. So uh, a lot of value that we provide to you. And here you can see TGAL, HP, um, they kind of, well, TGAL fell out at six tiles. Uh, HP fell out after eight tiles. But you can see here us and Dell EQ, and then we're still faster than everybody else in that regard. So very efficient when we come to performance and what we're doing with the underlying hardware as well. So, um, so I'm going to fly through if I could find my cursor. There it is. Um, so we do have a bunch of installations, a bunch of different markets, uh, segments and stuff like that. Um, and then here's just a couple example customers, um, you know, between medical, between universities, uh, manufacturing, and then also um, these guys do document imaging on the bottom left. Um, and they're doing replication, they're doing VDI, centralized storage, uh, you know, database functionality and stuff like that. In all these environments, we fit very, very well in. And you can kind of see the different capacities, you know, 50 terabytes, 20 terabytes, 70 terabytes, you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, a bunch of different types of referenceable customers. Uh, and these are just merely examples, basically. So, um, so a lot available there. And what I will do is swap over to a quick little uh, demo. Uh, just to kind of show you guys our latest and greatest array. Um, so we just simply log in. This is Google Chrome. Uh, we do have a plug-in right here also. I'm not going to really have time, but you can basically kind of go into, um, you know, which what's on what data store, what's on what host. You can kind of scroll down uh, and see where, you know, where your storage sits. Um, storage statistics, you can kind of see your latencies, your IOPS for the whole system and then also for particular volumes and stuff like that. So you can kind of hover over, see block sizes, latencies, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then if you do management, you know, virtual machine creation, uh, cloning, we support data, um, data cloning and instant cloning. So it's either the whole volume or basically just a snapshot of a volume. And of course, you can expand data stores and all that stuff. And so in here, you know, you can kind of just run through the thing, select your virtual machines, hit next, uh, and then go through there. And then also you can set set tasks, work in progress, and all that stuff as well. So just kind of a cute little um, plug-in uh, to kind of help you out, you know, with the advanced features within VMware. Uh, here you can see uh, the overview screen when you log in. This is going to be very similar to what we saw in the instant, uh, the storage reporting. Uh, so you can kind of see your IOPS, your read, write, latencies, um, and then also, you know, read IOPS, throughput. Uh, looks like I got a little bit of a write lot IO load. I need to, need to add some IO loads on the right side. Um, but there's an advantage to doing just reads, and that's to what we talk about with uh, the read tier. Um, so here you can see the different block sizes and stuff like that. So this was 4K. Uh, this right here was 8K, of which in here should be, um, yeah, you can see 8K random um, reads and writes there. Um, so if we go into volume stats, you can also divide these stats up into each individual volume and say, okay, where is my actual I.O. coming from? So this volume... Uh, this one just has, yeah, this has that uh, VMware infrastructure stuff on there, so it's not a lot of reads and writes and IOPS and stuff like that. Um, but here's the one that I'm actually running all that, that read IO from. Um, so you can see, you know, 8,800 IOPS, what have you, uh, megabytes per second, all that kind of stuff. So you can kind of see this stuff uh, very seamlessly here. Uh, if you do have multiple units, you can see that up, up top here in the discovery pane. Uh, you just select it and um, uh, click through to basically um, log into it. Uh, the hardware health, um, you can actually see a picture of the unit. You can see the I.O. going to the drives. Uh, that's just the cache piece right there. 
Um, and so basically you can kind of hover over, and so I am doing primarily a read I.O. load, right? The VMware stuff's on these drives. The yellows are the enterprise drives, the green are the consumer grades. Uh, and so you can actually see that read I.O. load um, coming from Iometer right there. Uh, CPU memory, network utilization, and then of course you can just flip it over and see kind of what network info, you know. I'm looking at four gig um, interfaces here. Again, we do support 10G and all that stuff as well. Um, hardware health, software health. Uh, if there was any scripting needs, you can get direct, directly into our um, UI from right, or into the SSH shell from here. Uh, full event logging. Uh, we can talk about, um, where is the dashboard right there? Uh, we do have UPS support. Updates are absolutely seamless. You can either download them directly from our FTP site that we provide to you, or you can just get them from a patch right here. Uh, it'll basically update one controller at a time. Uh, debug dump, similar type situation, um, you know, once every six months or so. Uh, support last for that. And just to try to get, you know, an idea of, hey, you know, where are we at um, performance-wise and everything. Uh, and here you can see the email alerts basically put in the server, whatever uh, um, name, DNS name, uh, and then basically your email address, which is mine right here. So I get the alerts that come in for this unit. Um, Dashboard is pretty simple there. And then if you go into things like the storage pool, you can see the individual arrays, um, individual drives, how much space is being used by array. Uh, and then if I go into this volume right here, this is the one that we're running that read I.O. to, we can say, okay, how much is in our tier one space? Zero. So now this is the write drive. This is the read drive. So it realizes that there is only, um, oh, this is on a different uh, volume. That's uh, worker two here is the 3600 hello. Uh, so this is all reads right here. So now we know we are actually not only wa watching the I.O. load, and we gave priority to this and pushed it down to that tier because it was all reads, but also we're not going to waste the enterprise drives, which is the expensive drives, on just reads. So a uh, very huge note in that regard uh, for that. And of course, we have a lot of SRM tools. Uh, workflow management, basically, we're watching the I.O. load hour by hour, and so we reduce how much background functions we do in the middle of the day. Uh, and here you can actually see the I.O. load. And like we said before, the tier two is the consumer grade. That's where all of our I.O. is coming from and stuff like that. And then, of course, wizards to basically do everything. So um, I'll just kind of run through this while Tiger uh, kind of says goodbye. <laughs> yeah, um, so we're kind of up against the hour here. Greatly appreciate everyone participating in the event today. We did have two uh, quick last minute questions come in that I wanted to uh, address really quick. Um, first one came in, uh, James, what is our theoretical limit um, on I.O. for your flash SAN? I'm guessing that means all flash SAN? Um, sure. So basically for, and it doesn't matter which, which one it is, uh, so the theoretical limits, uh, 250,000 IOPS, um, and then basically the under one millisecond on the all flash unit because there is dedupe and compression, that's 100,000 IOPS. Okay, very cool. And um, you kind of just went over this a little bit, but if you just wanted to reiterate, um, what kind of error reporting um, do you have for faulty disks? Like yeah, basically that goes into the email alerts and all right. that kind of stuff. Um, of which you do get alerted on all that. They just email right out to you. Uh, as well as, actually, I didn't say the store aid support team also will receive all these alerts. So, so long as you're under support, you'll actually have, um, you know, them just go ahead and send out that data and stuff like that for you, so. Well, very cool. Well, uh, we definitely want to be conscious of everyone's time, so again, we thank you for participating today. Um, the tools that James mentioned today, the uh, iData tool, um, the dedupe analyzer are all available on the Store Trends, uh, Store Trends website. Again, these are absolutely free if you want to learn a little bit more about your environment. Um, if you're looking for a particular quote of any sort, um, feel free to visit our price quote generator. Um, again, it's a hassle-free quote. Um, if you're looking at storage at some point, you know, soon or down the line, I'm always happy to give you some preliminary budget numbers. Again, hassle-free. Um, other than that, James, did you have uh, anything else for the nice people before we let them go? No, thank you very much for coming, um, listening to us. Definitely reach out if you have any questions, anything at all. It's no big deal at all. Uh, we are always available. Um, and, yeah, thanks a bunch.
Yes, indeed. And any questions that uh, come in here towards the end, um, we'll address those. Either send you an email or we'll address them over the Q&A chat. So if you put in a, um, a last-minute question, um, feel free to let me know and we'll address that um, uh, via the Q&A communicator or something like that. Other than that, everyone, thank you so much again for your time today. Um, we greatly appreciate the uh, opportunity. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye, guys.